welcome here at QTCon Academy to my talk about PR for open source projects. Feel free to interrupt me, feel free to correct me, feel free to tell me that I'm telling stupid, th stupid things. This is just a collection of stuff I learned in some almost 20 years in Linux and open source stuff. I've done this, I've given this talk some, several times and it's growing, so I'm happy for your input. So feel free to interrupt me. My name is Markus Fallner, I'm team lead at SUSE, team lead for documentation at SUSE. And before that, I have been, I had been working for about eight years as open source journalist, as journalist as, at Linux Magazine, Germany. Um, always biased, always pro open source. <laughs> and so I think I learned, is, th is this, oh, okay, it's double. Um, so I think I, I, I can, yeah, I learned some lessons and I, that I'd like to share and that many open source projects need. And so, here we go. I am, as, as I said, I was a journalist before, but now I'm a sort of a lizard, a green one. And I am, some words about me, I sort of have this strange hobby that I'm collecting some things, like I'm a priest, collecting titles maybe. I'm a priest for the Universal Life Church, so if you need me for marriages or divorces or whatever, just feel free to talk to me. I'm a diplomat for the Conk Republic, which is a not recognized or not accepted island republic in the Florida Keys. I own some property on the moon and I'm a Jedi Knight. And yes, I've been writing lots and lots of pages and stuff for this magazine here, which is the oldest print magazine about Linux on this planet. And then last year in March, I switched the side and I went to SUSE in Nuremberg, Linux distributor. And when I came there, I, I came to their museum and then what, what I saw in the museum was exactly that kind of Linux that was my first Linux that I had installed. This one was not, I, I had even one version before that because that is the CD-ROM version of SUSE. I had a friend who came and uh, brought me some 50 or 40 floppy disks and then we had a funny night and the next day I did not know what to do. <laughs> but now I'm working at SUSE and what I'm, I'm in charge of the team that writes the documentation. My team maintains about 11,000 pages of documentation and uh, well that's including all documentation that has been written for older versions of our software but it's quite a lot so team is about 10 to 13 people well, it's yeah soon it will be 13 people and you all that we, everything that we write is gnu free documentation license so let's now go into this workshop um, I've done this workshop for the first time at Academy in Tampere, which I just learned is five, six, seven or eight years ago. It was in 2009 or something like that, we think. So, 2010? Wow. <laughs> and we did this for a whole day with active contribution from the people. So, if you have questions, if you have a project that, or a, a question about your project, really interrupt me, ask me. I sort of condensed it for this half hour, 45 minutes, one hour. <laughs> we will see how long we take uh, for this presentation. Um, we'll have, uh, this is, I call this a mini workshop. And what I'll tell you about is about basic benefits of project promotion, which is rather obvious, but it's quite good to, 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 to hear about it again, because it may be arguments when you argue with people who say, no, PR is ugly, we don't like PR and whatever, then you, may need some arguments to convince them. And I will tell you about project descriptions. Oh, avoiding typos, obviously not. <laughs> and um, what things like elevator pitches are. And I'll give you some suggestions for the website, for videos, for how to dealing with the ugly press. And uh, about direct outreach, tabling at conferences and how to write announcements, articles, blogs, and dealing with social media and those fucking emotions. Oops, did I really say that? No, I didn't. I didn't say that loud. Um, promotion for your promoting your project is, I mean, I, this is telling the obvious, I think. 
Um, it, it should bring more users, which again should bring more ideas, new features, new ideas, or also tell you about bugs in your, soft, in, in your software, in your project. You will hopefully get more developers, which I learned is an issue for KDE, for example. Um, but you also gain, gain, with more users, you also gain more translators, designers, artists, packages, advocates, everything. I told you, this is basic. <laughs> so it's about growing your community. And it's also about getting in touch with other communities and uh, finding uh, new intersections, maybe, with other projects. For that, for stuff like that, one of the most important things that you need for a project, for a, let's think for a new project, is a project description. What does it do? What is it? And that, in, for use in multiple contexts, something like one or two sentences. Um, it should focus on what the user sees. It should focus on user experience. Don't go down too much in details. It's just about one or two sentences. And it should help someone unfamiliar with the project to get a sense what it is and what it does. Very basic again. And it should be written with the fact in mind that this is something that could appear everywhere in your project in communications, on the website. Um, for example, someone still knows Gblur? So that's a project description that pretty obviously doesn't work. Or do you think, what do you think? About, if I take half of the first sentence, that's pretty punchy. G blur is a Python script that blurs images. Uh huh. You know, that, that uh -huh. at least says what it does and what you can see as a user. But if you don't know shit about image uh, the, uh, publishing or, uh, or picture rendering or whatever, then some, a user won't know what it does. I think. For the end user, Python is not relevant, I guess. If it's for the end user. That's a good point, I think. That might be interesting for the developer, but it's too, I think it's just too complicated and it's, it, it, if you don't know anything about the, about the, 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 the image processing, I think the second example is better. It's a Python script, okay, yeah? That's good for the developers. It applies a blurring technique to raw photos. Gaussian blur, that's so far in, I, I think it's not really that important, but it's, in the sec that therefore, it's in the second sentence. And we eliminated the IRR alg algorithm. Just as an example, try to be easy and simple. Um, what you also need, these, these, there's, there's three kinds of these short descriptions for your project. That the project description is what will appear everywhere on websites. And then you have an elevator pitch and kitchen calls. These are terms. Elevator pitch is from marketing and kitchen call is from journalism. The, um, the elevator pitch is something that, imagine you are in, uh, in an elevator with the, the, the super rich CEO and you want him to, to spend money into your project. That's the classical marketing scene, yeah? So you have 30 seconds and you have to explain the whole of your project and convince him why he should open his pocket and, and, and pour the millions on you. So that's a very short sentence on, yeah, we are doing that and that and that, and that is really cool, and that's why we will be totally successful. Yeah? Whereas uh, a kitchen call is something the journalists will know, is something that really is one sentence that describes the whole article. In, in, in journalism, for example, yeah? So that the elevator pitch is to con con to, has the intention to convince somebody of doing something, whereas the, the kitchen call is just the ultra-most densest um, summary. KDE, desktop environment with lots of applications. Can I say it shorter? Is everything in? So just think of the shortest possible way. So there's three different things. The project description, 
is longer, two sentences is universal. The elevator pitch is to convince somebody to do something, and the, the kitchen call would be just as, as reduced to the max as possible. Reduced to the max. And tell the story. Hmm? Still tell a story in one sentence. Yeah. So What's peculiar about your project? In one sentence. I put Katie on free BSD. Uh huh. Full stop. Okay. But that, so my. That's, my, that's, that's my like, project. that's a kitchen call. So now convince me why should I do that? <laughs> in two sentences. <laughs> Yeah, that's the elevator pitch. The project description would now take this kitchen call and make two paragraphs or something like that out of that uh, for the uninitiated. So maybe you would want to explain what BSD is in, a, in, a, in three words. Yeah. Uh, so and I think these three things, these, these, these three short, um, the shorter some element gets in when working with words, the more difficult it is. The, wor the worst form of wordings in journalism is headings and uh, captions for, for, for images. Because you, don't, you have a limited amount of space. And that's where... Oh, this is interesting, I thought. So you need this stuff for your website, which has general information about your project, but it should be written for a newbie, my opinion. News on your website will always be good. Make sure that it's individually linkable, so that each news, each news item, I think WordPress does that, for example, does all modern CMS do that automatically, um, that you can link it and that people can link and send it or post it and share it. But one very important thing that many open source projects fail to do is provide a press page for the media. And define at least a single person responsible for press contacts. We have community managers and other stuff, but just one person or even better is a group, a press team. If your, team, if your, if your project is big enough, you can do 24 or 7 just by time zone things. Yes? If you have five, six people in a group, whatever. But that's just because most journalists can't wait. They, are, uh, they have so much work and so, much, and so little and very little time for it. So they mostly, when they, have the, when they realize they need some information about your project, then they might need it in the next two hours or something like that. That's, I, I've done this job, so that's my experience. Um, a press team will be the number one address for your journalists, for journalists contacting your project. They will identify, it will actively, so it's the, the number one contact in incoming stuff, but it also will be, it should be actively communicating. Identifying important media, making lists, constantly blogging, plusing and sharing, and preparing contact for the press, content for the press. I will tell you what a press kit is, and it will keep that the press team is in charge of keeping the press kit up to date on the website, and it will run something like the press at your project org mailing list. When you're talking to the press, when they are talking to the press, there's some little caveats. Um, the Americans will have heard of the vice president under, um, under Lyndon B. Johnson in the 60s, Hubert Humphrey. He said, it's always a risk to speak to the press. They, they, they might publish what you say. <laughs> and it's important when you talk to the press, give them hard news, hard facts. Um, that, that's, all, that's again marketing and PR stuff. It's about hard news, it's about facts. Journalists want concentrated facts, no big babbling around. So if, when I met people like politicians or whatever, there's people where you don't start talking to them anymore because you know it will take half an hour at least <laughs> to get one answer. Hard facts is appreciated by journalists. What they appreciate is thought leadership. If you have people who, who have a vision and who are sort of way ahead and can articulate that. And 
Then the next very important thing is relationship building. So talk to the people, meet them, invite them, build up a personal relationship. Then you will have you will you will be able to get a, a mutual trust situation. Then then the risk you can minimize this risk about having them told something that the other guy in your project doesn't want the press to know yet. So that's another just side aspect. Journalists, you will have to do with mis mischievous or with suspicious journalists that think that you won't tell them the truth. Um, when, especially when things go wrong. There is uh, the saying, or Ingham's razor, or Henlon's razor, they call this, uh, never attribute to malice, which is adequately explained by stupidity. So the, the journalists will come up to you and tell you there's something significantly going wrong here. Yeah? And you have to tell them, no, 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 we're just a stupid bunch, and this is, ah, yeah. Things like that, quotes like that, and help in such situations to, to convince them. And that mean, that's also, when you have this personal relationship with those guys, you can be open and frank about, to them and take them aside and say, okay, listen, this is not for the public, but this is not what happened. <laughs> and they will believe you once you have this personal relationship. For this personal relationship, the press team should, I said that before, collect the press, this, sort of a press distribution list. A list with press people on it that are interested in your project or media, that, media contacts that are interested in this, in this project. That can be, it, it, it's, it's a simple list, no big tools required. You can have an Etherpad, a wiki, or a, on a mailing list or whatever. But start making a list of people that are tech journalists or related, or other multipliers, that other people that you know, they talk to journalists. Then ask them if they are fine with you sending them news of new versions and stuff, and keep the signal to noise ratio low. That's very important. Journalists you tend to get tens or hundreds of newsletters a day. So if you send them too many, they will not focus on them, will are more likely to not read them. If you send them less but more relevant um, information, the chances are higher that they read it. But you have to find that out. Journalists are different there. And how to find that out is easy if you talk to other open source projects. I've, as a journalist, I have talked to pro whatever project they told me, yeah, have you heard what they do? That's really cool. Have a look at that. And that's a synergy that, that the open source world has among the projects. And then you can ask, you know who to address. You, I can ask Adrian and ask him, hey, um, wanna, I want to publish something in, 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 in Holland, in, in Netherlands or whatever, or in England. Do you have a contact there? Who am I to address there? And he may know somebody. Basic. <laughs> And invite us. <laughs> I'm not, I'm only, I'm at Susie now, but invite us. Invite the journalists to events, to discussions, whatever. I was at Academy as a journalist. I, I came to some KDE sprints. I was interested in KDE PIM development. I went to KDE PIM sprints where only 20 or 30 people were there of KDE only developers. I was the only journalist and they were like, that's the first time a journalist is here. But they told me about it, and uh, I think then it was Bernhard Reiter, it's long, long ago, who said, that, that's something happening, so we're doing some amazing stuff, you should come and have a look at that. And I wrote an article on it. That's, it's, it's really cool, let's uh, contact them. In interviews, there is, again, it's important to focus on differences, so what is different, what has changed, what, is, uh, what are we doing new, what is, what is new, improved, other, different. Um, mind also the difference between the, the journalist's approach and your approach, so they may not be that deep into the matter. And they want to focus on relevance, so there may be stuff that, that you think is very, very important, but which the journalist either just doesn't, doesn't get or doesn't think it's that important. They have a different aspect of it. Um, and 
you want to these four items difference relevance um, credibility and vision you want these the, these four things as as an impression in the in the press you want to after the interview want you want to have told them that your project is different is new or different that it's important that uh, what you're doing is a good thing is sustainable and that you have a vision that goes beyond this, the current state. That's why I have these four points here. Difference, relevance, credibility, and vision. So what does your company do? Why is it different? What's the most important? Then you need communication skills, or just find somebody with communication skills to convince of, and to, to be credible. And this, these guys, they have to, to have active mirror neurons. Have you heard of that concept in the head? Okay. Um, When you're talking to somebody, when you're looking at somebody, when you're looking at pictures in your brain, in our brain, there's some, there's some part in our brain who, uh, like, like, a, like in a cinema or in a movie, like mirrors what's happening in the other guy that you're talking to. So if you're watching people of, of uh, if you're watching photos of some people laughing, a little part of your brain will be laughing. If you're watching photos of somebody, Who, has, who is crying, a little part of your brain is crying. That's something that's automatically, you cannot prevent that. But there is people who are more skilled with this and can actively use this. And that is what we mean, what, that is a large part of empathy. Understanding what's happening in somebody else. I look at you and I have a, may have an, an understanding what's, what's right now happening in you. Something like, what the fuck is he talking about me now? <laughs> and what, whatever. So, but that's in, important for interview situations that you also see, basically again, just see that the, the journalist is in some completely different spheres now and has some completely different interest or is not interested in what you're saying anymore. You have to focus, focus on the, on the facts, on the central things, and not talk about some, yeah, some holiday that you did years ago. And you have to listen and build bridges between your topics and their topics. Venn is for Venn diagrams. I'll have one later. It just, it's just a nice tool to, that you can use within a, within a discussion to find out, is this still my topic? Am we, are we talking about what I have to say, or are we talking what this guy has to say? I'll have a diagram for that. And then there is the thing with the first impression. I have the first impression that you give to somebody is very important, but nevertheless, it's, it's not the only impression that you leave with somebody. Especially in times of multimedia, with photos or video recordings or whatever, um, I am, I am, I try to play with, with first impressions and giving people a wrong first impression of me because it's fun to see what happens afterwards. <laughs> it's just some hacking thing, maybe, whatever that I like to do. But it's important when you're talking to interviews to press people, then it's important to try to give a good first impression and remember what you said. I already said that, connect with journalists also on social media. <laughs> the journalist will get at the interview situation, he will get a press kit. The press kit should, but should also be available on the website. If you can print it or make a, make a folder with some stuff, if you have the resources to do that, that's fine. And you have something to give to the journalist and they'll appreciate that. Um, It should be on the website, downloadable, and the press team should be in charge of it and take care of it. What should it contain? It should contain, of course, the project description. What is it? And a guided tour to the, through the best and newest features for somebody who has no clue about anything about your project. Yeah? Therefore, if it's a graphical program, uh, then you should add screenshots. Take care of the license. This is very important. It has to be some kind of free license, not commercial, so that the journalists can use those screenshots in publications. Otherwise, they will have to set it up their own and do their own screenshots, and that's easier. So it has to allow commercial use for the magazine, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so NC is dead. <laughs> Non-commercial is dead, in my opinion. So we couldn't, at Linux Magazine, we could not use Wikipedia photos, Wikimedia photos, 
no, Wikipedia, which is Wikimedia, Media Wiki Photos. Um, sorry, photos from Wikipedia, uh, because they used to be a non-commercial license, and then for I think it took them five years to to remove all NC content, and now there is only CC content because. Uh, there's also court rulings about NC. NC is not specified. It's not spe specified. There is, in, at least I think in Europe, it's not specified which is commercial use. When you run a blog, yeah, and you earn 20 euro per year with ad ads on that blog, is that commercial use or not? <laughs> it's too difficult. So, what's happening here? I'm having a. Pop up. Thank, thanks that you didn't see it. Um, yeah, no, no non non commercial. That's just just CC. That's okay. I mean, you're not earning money with the screenshots, so they're not real assets. And again, the press contact, phone mail, instant messaging, Facebook, Google Plus, whatever. When the press needs something, they will need it fast. And that's exposed exposure. This person, this team is exposed. That's their job. At your website, I just see. Yeah. Helpful items at your website for journalists is the news archive, so that when I go there, I can just grab through, okay, what was the last things that happened, and since when is this feature? Then I can, in my news, I can write, and um, since 2007, they, they introduced that, blah, 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 and so. Um, I'm already in the middle of the project's history that should be there. A list of distributions packaging your software. So how to get. A list of major dependencies, If like we had with the gblur thing, that's a Python script, was already in the, in the prescription, so I can think, okay, I may have to install Python if I don't have it, if I want to use it. And uh, also events you plan to attend, and how and where journalists can meet and contact you. There may be links to related projects. You may get return links from them. And of course, if you have any documentation, install guide, quick install, and information about what help is needed. Again, you have to expose yourself if you want to do PR and if you want to do the press about your project. Ideally, you have a team of people who are ready to say, okay, yes, I stand for this project. I'm running this project. You can show like, well, KDE does pretty well with the, con with the academy and the, the academy photos of all the participants. So show the major contributors, leaders, and advocates that drive the project. If you want, put, put some biographies, photos, or links to their blogs and social media links there. I know this is a controversial topic, but it's... For PR, it's necessary. And let them talk about why and how they started the project. Everybody loves to hear and read such stories. Someone, I think few people like to write it, <laughs> but everybody loves to read it. So why does he do that stuff? Press rooms. Um, on the website, if your project is bigger, you may want a press room. A room, not only a press site, a press room for the... That's uh, a special uh, realm of sites, of links for the press, with press kit and all that stuff inside. So if it's bigger, if you have more to tell and a longer history, that's what big companies do. Very important, don't require registration. Just make it open for everybody. Because registration is, again, a hassle for the journalist. Oh, I've got a password, yeah, somewhere, whatever. It's just a, a, a hurdle to get in there. Um, if you have a press room with, a lo with lots of information, provide a quick search through the material you have there. Link to the, your FAQs and documentation and stuff that you have. And have a look at how big companies do that. Do I have Wi-Fi here? Uh, let's see. So, for example, let's take Firefox. Did 
Yep, yep. Let's see if I have Wi Fi, I didn't check. Otherwise. Now there's data coming. Yeah. There is a Wi Fi bit on the back Yeah, that's what I'm using, I thought. It's interesting, where do I get redirected? Vodafone, free Wi Fi, nice. Who's that? <laughs> that's doesn't it uh, mm. Okay, now I'm on the QT. Let's see again. So you see Microsoft has a huge, that's all newsroom and press stuff here from Microsoft. The highlights, and that's all stuff that Microsoft writes for the press, and they have press tools, they have press contacts, press release, and lots and lots of stuff. And Google, I, all, I had all of this open in the browser, but I had to reboot. Yes. <laughs> um, uh. See, yeah, this is Google. Google has a little bit less intrusive or a little um, simpler design. Taking my mouse, it will be easier for its website, but you can see the same information there. Access to the news and uh, contacts, follow us on Google+. You have the Twitter resources, there's everything that you need. Microsoft obviously focus more, focuses more on uh, getting uh, on, on, on the visual, on the images, and Google is more focused on the information. Now, when you look at how SUSE and Red Hat do that, let's have SUSE, and this will be faster now because now I have the... Does, it, does that mean if you're on Google and as a journalist, you see this, like, no visuals, so I will have to still create the visuals to make the story up? How do you, I didn't understand that. What do you mean? As a, if, if you as a journalist would end up on Google, would you have the, the, the feeling like I will still have to figure out the, the visuals myself if I want to make a story out of this? I would prefer the Google version, definitely, because I've, I'm faster to where I want to go. I have the press at google.com email address right there. It's, I, 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 feel the, I think the Microsoft side is a little bit bloated for my taste <laughs> with visuals and stuff. But th that's what they want. They... they they, they, they want to tell their story, whereas I would say Google is an example for more content focused. Huh? So, and uh, the main information is, this is the official Google blog with the, with, the day, with the news that they had, that I think, and here is the media context. That's, ba that's basically what I, as a journalist, would want when I go there, I think. Huh? So, this is Suze, and I think we are doing quite fine there as well, as, as at least when I'm, if I'm asking Se Sebastian, if I ask you, when you go, when you're a journalist and you go to a website of a company, yeah, would you, would you, I, I was just asked, because this is the Microsoft newsroom, lots of images, and I would, I would rather prefer this, the, 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 the style that Google has with but only information and a quick way to press people and stuff, so... The Microsoft side is totally loaded, you don't find anything. Um, you can't work with that. Yeah. Uh, so what's the latest news? <laughs> yeah. Right, but, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, as a small team, if you have to uh, also create all those images, it's... it's, it's a, lot of a lot of work. So if you say, well, just the bullets and, and the contents, if that's enough, then it's great. Yeah. How many do you have there? 
Ja. Ja, das ist Signal-to-Noise-Ratio again. See, Google, they don't have a news in their blog every day, here. Huh? I mean, they, they, they are huge, but they have fifth, August 15, August 24, August 25, Wednesday 31, and there may be other stuff on blogs and social media, but that's linked, and that's pretty focused, I would say. And I also think that, that Suze is doing that pretty much the same, even less. I think that's about two news per month huh? in the newsroom. You have the search engine here, the main thing, and every news is individually linkable. I want to see, let's see. Can see that. Did I spell it right? Open Suze. A bit slow. In the meantime, um, Red Hat Press. So this is the. OpenSUSE site, which is, in my opinion, also, it's optimized for tablets. It, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's cool, but it's, it's also difficult to find stuff here, I think. Yeah? Here's where you find stuff, but, and news. I don't think this is the best one. Um, where's Google coming? Red Hat. It's looking for Red Hat here. They have also got their own newsroom. And while this is loading, I'm taking the, as an example, uh, from here. KDE. So, so this is Red Hat's press room. This is sort of a mixture, I would say. Yeah, it's pretty much visual. But here is the news. Also pretty clear. They have a search engine here. You can filter. You have uh, options on how to present it. But it's uh, also text focus, information focus. You find stuff there. Yeah. Um, KDE press page offers the story, information on KDE. So that's the basics. But there's, for example, no link to news, or am I wrong? Did they add one? Last time I looked, there was no. There is on the front. Where is it? I don't see it. Am I wrong? Just KDE.org, there's links to the docs. And so not from this press page, but if you go to the home page of KDE. Yeah, then you'll have a link to news. Yep. Right. <laughs> Got it? Um, so, and let's compare that to gnome.org slash press. Right. Which doesn't load. Is it blocked? Have I spelled it correctly? I think so. I think it's just the Wi-Fi being slow. Uh, Should I? Does this work? Does this does this work? Anybody knows if the the LAN works? Oh, there it is. 
See, GNOME, press page, spot the difference, the news in the front. Yeah? They have, then they have technologies about us, yeah, but that's also, that's, so, that's the press page. But this doesn't have any of the other story, history. And it's all okay. six months old. That is all here. Under about us, technologies and, and, and stuff, huh? Yeah, that's another thing. <laughs> it's constant work. So, does it work? Yes. So, we had the press rooms as examples. I don't have Red Hat in here, here, here now. The summary is make it easy. Think of journalists as someone completely new to your software. We don't know shit. <laughs> they want to get the most information, they want to get the most information possible in a very short time. They want to contact you, give them the chance to succeed. They need material for their article, give them a press kit with screenshots and stuff. Make it easy for your users too. Give new users an easy way to start. Give new users an easy way to get involved. Give all users links to the information they need. And make it clear what your license is. Explain where and how decisions are made. And that's all stuff that, that the press also will need to tell the story about your project because the, the, the journalists will want to, they, they will know nothing about your project, but they will write for people who equally don't know anything about your project, but they might be interested in contributing and learning more. So your press kit slash website press work should be enabling new people. One thing that gets a, a lot of attention easily is videos, if you can. Today, uh, everybody got a smartphone and the camera that does video, and when I first held this speech, there was something new where people would set up studios and stuff like that. I, I had to remove some of the, of the funny videos because they are either today they are not funny anymore, they're, they're different times, or they are, they are not available anymore. But um, viral video charts, they show trends and good ideas. And there's some websites like viralvideos.com, viralvideos.com, where you can go and see or um, meme websites and whatever. I learn how to make a clip and ask and colleagues and friends for contribution and devastating criticism. At the beginning, it's hard, but it's fun. It can be really fun to do some stuff like that. The, that's what I said that time. Then video audio quality matters. They, ma they matter. Use or set up a studio if you can. Um, the document syst management system DMS um, Agorum. They made some. They, would, they made some of the example videos I had in here. They were ridiculous because if you know the people like Hein Horst Breuner from the Stadt city of Schwäbisch Hall here in Germany, um, in their office, and they they did funny videos. At, for that time, that was really cool, and they, they they had set up equipment like here for that. But today, you can do so stuff with smartphones. Um, as long as it isn't really, really, really bad quality. You see more and more videos in social networks and whatever. Try to do stuff like that and ask friends and colleagues and be ready for devastating criticism. They will tell you, no, you can't do that on stage. And then you'll say, Sapa did it. And then they say, no, <laughs> whatever, try. And if you succeed, that's really, it's really cool. And that's, that's going to spread by itself. Yeah? There's websites like knowyourmeme.com where you can go and look for memes which are currently trending and, and, other, and stuff, and you can combine that maybe with your stuff. Just try it. It may be fun. And that's one thing. If you succeed, that's really, really cool for, for the project. Yeah, fun, sex, edgy stuff is what works. What was the last video that you sent around? That's, that's what works. Um, there are how-tos, how to kill your viral video, including do's and don'ts around. The, this presentation will be shared, I think, as far as I heard. So, I, and this is a, this is a really good how-to on, it's old, but it's still good. And one of the main sentences out of that is, don't be the judge. 
think of your audience. So just because you don't like some particular things, your audience may like it. So ask people, talk with people, they will tell you. Going back from, from videos and viral stuff, going back to direct outreach, you may want to present your project on, at conferences or in schools or at meetups or at nerd talks, whatever. How do you do that? How do you reach that? Go to people, ask them. Most of them are happy to... Not, it's, it doesn't have to be the call for papers for a presentation, for a presentation like here. Most, mostly it's a matter of asking and the hackerspace or the school or whatever. Just talk to people, ask them. They, they are mostly happy to have some people telling them, hey, I got a cool thing and I, I want to talk about it. And after the third time, you'll have a working presentation. <laughs> Research your target and your pitch, elevate the pitch, remember, specifically, so uh, tell, get the story. Tell, get, when you're in a school or whatever, then think about what might the teacher be interested in. Then get feedback from them and proofreading help. It's always the most important. You know it, publish early, publish often. Tabling at conferences and whatever is something else. You need to have logistics. You have to have a booth set up. You have the goal settings. Or you have, what do you, why do you go there? What do you want to reach there? What, is the, what do you want to have there? What, just tell the people about your existence. Just be there or give ice, free ice cream to everybody. Who's going to be at the tables? You need people to, have, to stand at the tables. And even on the third day, those people who are standing there and are bored and tired, they still have to have the smile. Yeah, it's marketing. It's not nice, but it should keep it positive. So, and what will you actually say? Things like, hi, greeting with eye contact. At least I will, okay, the, at least in Europe, I was told in US, eye contact is, be, is being seen differently. But in Europe, eye contact, ask questions, ask about the people who come up to your booth, ask them what do they do, okay? and respond, listen to them, and you, you know the attention span of people is limited. And it's, it's getting smaller and smaller with social media. You may have heard about the goldfish in the glass. He only survives in the glass because he's got, he is said to have an attention span of uh, something like 30 seconds. So he sees the world outside, he sees a living room and thinks, okay, this is boring, I'll have a swim. And when he comes back, he's like, wow, living room, cool. So don't overload people with information. People can usually listen something like 20 seconds. When you're talking longer than 20 seconds, the, the other one is slowly losing his interest or losing his focus. And it, this, this time period is getting slower and slower. Part, that's part of why Trump has so much success in the US, because he's reduced stuff. And then spot the right moment to bring up your goal if, you're, if it's appropriate. And always try to close positively. Close a discussion positively, because if the other guy goes away, he'll have a good feeling. It's bad to go away with a negative thing. Just try to find something positive. Bridging. If you disagree on topics, if you have this guy who is talking about GNOME and you're in KDE, then try to build bridges between, yeah, but both better than this other desktop or whatever. Try to build, build bridges or build bridges into another argument from your side. So get away from the, from the controversy, get into the stuff that brings you together, build bridges on, on several layers. Writing stuff. You will be, I have some, this is an overview of the next pages. You, how to write press releases. The press release, the first press release was written after an accident, train accident in Atlantic City. And it can trigger your audience, alert journalists to something new. Don't do it too often, signal to, to noise, I said that. Don't do it too often, only when really interesting things happen. The Venn diagram, I've said that before. If you talk to somebody, for example, on a phone, make two circles. Yeah? Left circle is his thing that he wants to tell. The right circle is maybe what you want to tell. And then make dots on, on this paper during the conversation, what you're talking about. If, is it in your realm or is it more or less he explaining about his mother or whatever? And at the end of the conversation, 
you should be, most of the dots should be here, then it was successful. Because you both had, you agreed, you talked about something that both of you interested. Otherwise, you're boring people or you're bored. Relevance in a press release. Five, v, five W's, who, what, when, where, why. That's relevant. The inverted pyramid. Who, what, where, when, how at first. Important details next and then the background. That's a, a standard in, in, in PR, in, in, in writing a news release. Does this also suggest that you should have about three times as much who, what, where, when, how text? Oh, no, it, it, it basically means most people st read the first thing and less and less people come to the, to the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? So that, the first thing has the biggest outreach. Markus Fahne gave a speech at KDE Academy and QTCon 2016. Who, what, where, where, in Berlin. <laughs> yeah? Nobody's interested in that I've done this speech before. <laughs> um, you start with a lead, it's the first sentence. A lead is an opening sentence. That's the, that's the most important thing. That's what everybody reads, and they decide by this first sentence if they should read on or not. It gets the most attention. Readers decide if they leave. The rest of the first paragraph fills, fills out the lead. All five W's should be in the lead in the first sentence. Fact or emotion? You, you choose, both will work, depending on what you want to present. Um, that also works in novels, in literature. Here's a link like to American Book Review. Best starting sentences in, of all times. The best one, on number one, is from Moby Dick. Call me Ishmael. Ishmael, Ishmael, the first sentence. And there's also, I also have a link here for awardedly bad ones. You will re have a look at them. It's fun to read. Um, if you want to see some, I, I always pick The Guardian because I think on this planet they are sort of like the exceptionally best news writing people. And they can really help you. If you know this stuff, analyze the news they write, you'll see that they, they follow this. Um, so after the lead, the first paragraph is the lead, which should catch somebody. Yeah? The, the second paragraph is where you give him the, the, the meat. Yeah? That's the so-called nut graph. In a nutshell, yeah? that's the paragraph that has the, the central information in a nutshell. It's after the lead and should provide facts. It's the essence of your news release. And it will be found just after the lead, the second paragraph. It's providing facts. It's, it's, you have to still keep the language simple. Count the words between subject and verb. Eight is enough. Don't build long sentences. Check it for your language if you're not in English language. In German language, you can have more because German language is more complicated. But in English, it should not be more than eight words between subject and verb. Use strong words, appropriate images, correct grammar, and focus on the, focus on the important part. Have somebody else read it. and edit it. Towards the end, you provide sentences like, KDE is a desktop environment for Linux built on QDE. A sentence I would put there, for example. It's just the basics, the background. Did you have a question? QT no, OK. With a small t. Oh, yeah. That's uh, And then links to contact data, press room, and kit, yeah? Um, basically the same for email announcements, articles, blogs, make it clear what's new and what's interesting, make it linkable from elsewhere. Include the project description, website links, and links to events. Slow news days may give wider exposure. That means on, there's some days on, on Monday, a lot of things have happened from the weekend. Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe less happens, whatever. Or as we did on Friday evening in Linux Magazine, we will put some news there that is, that is colorful, that is a little bit more than just Linux tech, hot tech, so that's interesting for the weekend. Yeah? Yeah, and make your team members write articles for news outlets. Mentor them, that's cool. Social media. I mean, this is not new to you anymore. Social media is time thieves. Only Amazon and Facebook can tell you if, that's really making if they're really making money with it because Facebook, Amazon uh, exchange data. And only Facebook knows when some, uh, some advertisement from Amazon on Facebook has led to a 
to somebody buying something. And only Amazon knows that, that somebody who bought something came from Facebook. So nobody else can tell. There's no clear ROE. Social media, you know that Facebook's private, more private. Twitter is for media people and news spreading. Google Plus is tech people. Instagram pictures. Get somebody who knows what he, do, he does there. It's so important. They are skilled, people are skilled and you need them. Don't screw it up, it will go viral. And don't do it on your smartphone because uh, errors happen very easily there. It's nothing that you should uh, uh, automate. You can't just post your tweet on Facebook and on Google+. Plus. It doesn't work. People will see that, will know that, and it, you get less response for that. You have to have someone who does it separately. And there's a lot of software for that around. Use it. They've got the right tools. And don't forget to switch it off because lots of people get stuck in there and spend lots and lots of time. Last point with some funny pictures for the end. Um, good behavior. <laughs> How to react when press, when everything's blowing up. <laughs> yeah? Volcanoes are a good role model. If you, um, if you always keep back, then the explosion will be even bigger later. So if there's problems, try to solve them at once, and then you have smaller chunks. If you have a PR disaster, it's better to, to, to clean up the stuff at once than to wait. <laughs> yeah? be, try to be proactive. I picked the volcanoes because you may have heard that there's good and bad volcanoes around. Like, the ones that go up regularly are considered good and beautiful. Like here, this, this is um, Old Faithful in, in, in Yellowstone. If, they, if you explode regularly, people will get used to it if, in discussions and whatever, and nobody will be angry. And then it's just something somewhere quite marvelous. If you, if you don't explode regularly, something will build up, and huge things will happen. This is, what, um, hap this is the, the, the Yellowstone caldera, is a hotspot underneath the American continent, and uh, it exploded several times, and the last time it, ex it exploded, which is after it built up energy for hundreds of uh, thousands of years. The last time it went up, it was 640,000 years ago, so it's time again, and it covered half of North America with six feet of debris. Yeah? So the longer you wait, the bigger the explosion will be. There may be beautiful things after these big explosions, like landscapes like this, or like this, or like this in Europe. But there's a lot of things that get destroyed. This is Mount St. Helens, again, something. So this is one day before. Do you see all the forest in the ground and it's all gone? Yes, it's, uh, no. it just took hours. But others that explode regularly, like the Stromboli, this is me on the Stromboli some 20, almost 30 years ago. If it's exploding regularly, you are sort of accountable and foreseeable, and that's a much better way than even the ugly things in the background can be that are soaring and exploding all the time. You can just smile them away, even if you don't know what's really happening. Yeah? And you don't really care about it if the whole world behind you is going up in flames. So, I think I made it exactly in time. At least it looks like. Excellent. 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 Cool. We have two minutes left. Good. So, is there questions from the audience? Let's yes, I hope so. Get some questions, comments. There's much more information. As I said before, this thing was initially a one-hour, one-day workshop with people writing stuff about their project and. It certainly made me think, hey, I should go through the FreeBSD KDE site and see what, we, what we've got. Any other comments? Then we should applaud the speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks.